Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I would love to introduce Dr. Juliana Freire. She is our very own professor here at NYU, a professor of computer science and data science. Um, she is a very distinguished professor. She is the um, recipient of the NSF Career Award, two IBM Faculty Awards, the Google Faculty Research Award, the ACM SIGMOD Contributions Award. She is the inventor of over 12 US patents. She has co-authored over 200 technical papers. She has 11 award-winning publications. And her research has been funded by many different sources such as NSF, DARPA, DOE, NIH, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Yahoo, AT&T, IBM, as well as many other foundations. Um, she is the chair of SIGMOD, which is the ACM Special Interest Group of Management of, of Data, and she is the NYU lead investigator of the Moore Sloan Data Science Environment. Her research uh, focuses, focuses on uh, systems and methods for a wide range of users to obtain trustworthy insights from data. So this involves topics in handling large scale data, everything from analysis to integration to visualization to machine learning to provenance management and web information discovery. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ferry um, to give us a presentation on data set search and discovery methods, as well as augmentation and explanation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jackie, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation. Um, I should uh, mention that a few corrections. I'm done with my ACM SIGMOD term. Uh, I, I finished that last year, as well as with the Moore Sloan. So I now have more time to actually devote to my research that uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about. I would also like to say that um, we are part of the VIDA group, which is the Visualization Image and Data Analysis Center, which is right below from CASP. Right, so we're on the 11th floor here in the 370J, uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, background. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about you know, some work that we've been doing you know, for the last two years or so um, on uh, data discovery. And uh, of course, uh, every time that I talk, I have to say that this is not my work. This is work of uh, a bunch of people in the VIDA group, as well as external collaborators. So why do we care about data and data discovery? And um, so we increasingly, uh, we have been collecting and storing and using um, lots and lots of data, right? Uh, and, you know, you see this affecting different segments of our society. Uh, Data-driven exploration has uh, impacted it's science. Uh, if you look at the most scientific domains, they're moving towards data-driven exploration. And um, it has led not only to great advances and discoveries, but also it has changed how science is actually done. So in addition to hypothesis-driven research, scientists now engage in data-driven hypothesis generation. And this is what Jim Gray and his colleagues called the fourth paradigm of science. Goes without saying that companies are capitalizing on data. For some companies, data is actually what makes money. And it has been compared, you know, or, or as people have made an analogy between data and oil, right? That data is the new oil. And last but not least, and that's something that folks at CASPA know firsthand, government uh, and government agencies are uh, more and more using data to operate more efficiently, to make data-driven uh, policies that can better inform their decisions. And all of this, this, this transformation, this uh, data-driven revolution uh, was enabled by a perfect storm, which comes from the fact that computing and storage are now essentially free and we have lots and lots of data, right? And uh, there are data about everything. Governments uh, around the world, cities around the world are making their data available and the push towards transparency, you know, has not just made, you know, um, uh, uh, motivated these people to uh, uh, publish the data, but make them widely available in these uh, web accessible portals, right? And uh, we see that, you know, for governments and cities, but we also see that in science and, you know, in many other uh, different domains. 
And what is really cool about this is when you have all this data, there's lots of opportunities for us to enrich analytics and help us better understand different kinds of phenomena, as well as uh, you know, improve these predictive models that uh, also are helpful for us to uh, um, when you're ex exploring data. Right. So let me give you two concrete examples uh, of what I mean. Um, so for enriching analytics, uh, an example that I like to use is the N N New York City Vision Zero Initiative. And you may have heard about this. Uh, and this is something that has been done actually throughout the, uh, in different cities throughout the world. And uh, what people observed is that uh, when people drive fast on the streets, more people die. You have accidents and people are more likely to die if the speed is higher. And there was an intervention that was made here in New York City and the speed limit was reduced from 30 to 25 miles. And that was great. And the number of fatalities actually reduced. Uh, but at some point they started increase, increasing on game. And uh, there was this big question, what may have caused this increase in fatalities even though the speed limit continued to be at 25, right? Uh, so some people had uh, the, you know, intuition that maybe the cause was the fact that there was an increase uh, that um, a city bikes, uh, the city bike program started. And uh, the hypothesis was that because now you also have all these bikes on the streets, that led to this increase, increased number of fatalities. And you have data about the bikes, so you can find them at NYC Open Data, which you know some of you might be familiar with. And you can actually test your hypothesis by looking at the data and checking whether the number of active bikes is correlated with the increased uh, uh, number of fatalities, right? So having this data actually enable you to, you know, uh, test, the, you know, your hypothesis. Um, you can also use data to improve models. And uh, one thing that people here in New York City are often interested in is in predicting uh, taxi demand, right? Uh, and you know, people can create uh, predictive models using taxi trip data uh, and you know, look at different locations and where people need taxis and so on. And uh, of course, we know that you know, weather as well as uh, major events can affect traffic, uh, sorry, taxi demand. Uh, so one way of uh, you know testing this is to joining the data about taxis with data about events and data about taxis and see what happens. And in this case, what happens is that um, the model gets much better with the lower uh, uh, error. Right. So data augment augmenting data, getting additional data sets lead also to better models. But you know this is very good in theory. Uh, in practice. There is a big challenge because finding data is actually not that easy. Uh, there was a recent study within Lyft where they estimate that data scientists spend about 25% of their time just doing data discovery, finding the data the, that they need for analytics as well as to build the predictive models. And uh, one of the you know, challenges come from the fact that you, know, you have data sets and they're actually spread over many different websites and different repositories, right? Uh, but then you can turn back to me and say, you know, this is a, have a feeling of deja vu because in the beginning of the 90s, that's exactly the situation we were with uh, the web. There are pages everywhere and we cannot find anything on the web and web search engines solve these problems, right? Uh, and, you know, the, this kind of techniques that uh, were developed for web search engines have been applied for a uh, data set and uh, we, there are a number of data set repositories um, that uh, you know, address this problem by organizing you know, and combining uh, multiple data sets in a centralized place. Like for example, the uh, NYC Open Data, which uh, aggregates all the data from different uh, New York City agencies. Uh, another example is uh, Harvard Dataverse. Uh, which uh, where they collect a number of data sets that are used in papers uh, published in the social sciences domains, right? And these are examples of domain specific or vertical data set repositories, right? More recently, uh, Google uh, started, uh, you know, this uh, new uh, search engine called Google Dataset Search that is a, a search engine specialized for data sets. And what they do is that, um, as Google, the regular Google crawler crawls the web, 
it looks for uh, sites that have um, uh, files with the schema.org data set annotation. And when they find that, they discover, oh, that's a data set, and they bring that and index that, right? So uh, while these are domain specific, Google data set search is actually a broad search engine for data set that contain data sets about many different things, right? Oh, and by the way, if you if anybody has questions, please feel free to uh, uh, to interrupt me. Right. So yes, you know, uh, search technology can help here. Uh, and if you go to any of these uh, repositories, be it Google Data Set or you know the domain specific ones, uh, they can be used exactly like Google or Bing. Uh, you enter your keyword query, and then you get a bunch of results back, and each data set is actually described using a textual snippet that, in this case, for NYC Open Data, contains the title, the name of the data set, some description, and then when it was updated, and so on, right? So essentially, you know, these repositories, they're actually applying directly what the um, uh, traditional search engines do, right? But you know, is this ideal? Does this solve the problem of data set search? And uh, the truth is that it does not because um, data sets have different characteristics um, that make this search problem a little harder. Uh, first and foremost, if you just have a, a, a text snippet, it's really difficult to figure out what is inside that particular database. It's a difficult, if you have an information need and you just look at the snippet, uh, how can you really assess the relevance of uh, the data set for your need, right? So in the case of uh, the, you know, the um, vision zero example that I used before, you may have this hunch that the city bike uh, data is actually useful, but it's not clear. There's lots of city bike um, uh, data, data sets that, that mention city bikes. So you'd have to click, okay? I click When I click on the snippet, this is what I see. Uh, not much information about what is inside. It turns out that this uh, particular data set in NYC Open Data is not really stored locally. You need to go to the city bike website. Then there you have a bunch of zip files. And finally, you can look, uh, you know, the contents, you know. So it take, it's very hard. And without really looking at what the contents of the data set are, it's very hard to determine whether it's fit or useful for your particular task, right? So the problem here is not that you want to find data sets, but you also want to determine the suitability of those data sets for your problem. Right. Uh, another limitation of this technology is that it's, uh, it uh, heavily relies on keyword based queries. And when you're looking for a data set, depending on what, what you're trying to do, it's really impossible to express uh, what you need using just keywords. Right. Uh, in addition, there's a, a problem also that uh, these keywords, uh, this keyword search supported by these repositories, uh, do keyword based search on the title of the, the data set, as well as the metadata that is provided by the publisher or the creator of the data set. And um, this information is usually uh, can be very, um, how can I say, uh, can be incomplete. Right, uh, some data sets actually come with no metadata, right? Uh, and uh, what a recent study found was that uh, there's a, a mismatch between what user needs in terms of asking queries, data discovery queries, and the metadata and search capabilities of these repositories. Um, and you know, and all of this. Uh, you know, make these systems limited in the sense that you can search for you what you know, uh, but really you cannot search for unknown unknowns. You cannot really use the systems to obtain insights and find data that you didn't previously know about, right? So ideally what you'd like is instead of looking uh, for, okay, I wanna check whether city bikes actually cause uh, the increase in fatalities. What you'd like to find any data set in the period where you saw that increase in fatalities, right? That might explain why the fatalities increased, right? So can you really discover data that help you answer and get insights into uh, 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 factors that you might not have thought about? Okay, so another desiderata for when, you know, for data set discovery is that you need 
to be able to pose queries that discover these unknown unknown data sets. So in our research, we've actually been uh, investigating different problems uh, in, in this area. Uh, in particular, we've been looking at the different kinds of dis data discovery queries uh, that can be used to help explain and augment data. Uh, and our goal here is to be able to support queries that capture diverse information needs. Uh, and I'm gonna talk more about that shortly. Um, because of uh, this uh, limitation in terms of metadata and information that you have about the data sets, uh, that limits your ability to ask these questions. Uh, we are going beyond the metadata to try and leverage the content, not only the contents of the data sets, but also relationships across data sets. Um, and finally, um, uh, we've been implementing some of these ideas in an open source uh, data set search engine that we're developing here at the VIDA Center, Octus. And I'm also gonna give you uh, a, a brief demo of how the system works. So let's start with, uh, you know, one class of queries, uh, data discovery queries that uh, help you understand data, right? So here's a motivating example, and this is something that we actually went through here when we were uh, doing some work with the New York City taxi data. And we had this plot, you know, as we were analyzing the data, we had this plot that looked at uh, the total number of taxi trips and how it varied over each day. Uh, in this case, we're just looking at six months for 2011 and 2012, right? And that's really nice because you see that, you know, year after year, there's the same patterns, uh, you know, weekends, uh, there's fewer taxis during the week, there's more. Uh, and, you know, the, the red and the blue kind of like follow very similar patterns. You can see Christmas uh, here, you can see Thanksgiving and so on, right? Uh, but then you also have these weird drops where you have almost zero taxi trips in these two days in 2011 and 2012. So you might ask, you know, are these big data drops data quality issues? Is it the case that uh, the system that captures this information from the, the GPSs that are inside the taxis were broken, right? Or is it the case that these were real events that really got the taxis out of uh, the streets in New York City? Right. Uh, and does anybody have any hunch? Is this a data quality problem or is this uh, a bug? Uh, or is this uh, were these real events? Anybody in the audience? My guess is going to be that it's either natural disasters or major events such as. OK, that's a very good. Uh, Not natural hunch. disasters, like weather, I meant like weather exactly, yeah, like a hurricane. Okay. Yeah. So, so these were Hurricane Irene and Sandy. Uh, I was actually, that was my first gift. I moved to New York in 2011. And, you know, that's what I got the, uh, uh, right after I got here, right? So, um, so if you actually look at the wind speed data for the, the same time periods, what you're going to see is that the days when you had, you know, very low number of taxi trips corresponds to dates that uh, the wind speed was unusually high, right? So here, you know, it's got to give you this intuition that, you know, it actually may be possible that we can discover data to explain data. Right. So in this case, you know, the drops in taxi can be easily explained by these two hurricanes. Right. So but how do we go about, you know, discovering these da uh, data driven explanations? Right. So what we'd like to do is that you have a data set that you're exploring and if you find weird features, you know, that you don't know if they're, you know, uh, bugs or uh, real important uh, features, right? You'd like to find, uh, so you have your data set that you're exploring, but then you also have a collection of data set and you'd like to find data sets in this collection that are uh, in, you know, let's look, go back to this urban example, right? T taxi uh, trips. You'd like to find data sets that are temporally and spatially related to that, that can be aligned uh, with your, uh, the data set that you are uh, exploring, right? And they have, uh, overlapping salient features, right? So you'd like to find the same outliers or the same near outliers aligned in space and time, right? So the query you'd like to find is, you know, find me all data sets that are related to this given data set. 
And this can be useful to uh, identify or rule out these data quality issues. Uh, it can also help you find uh, new features to enrich predictive models and explain these interesting features, right? So this is kind of like a, was the first kind of uh, what we call relationship query, right? So here you have to think about uh, instead of asking queries as, as keywords, your data set will be your query, right? And you'd like to find data sets that are related to it in different ways. And uh, when we define relationship queries, we define two different components. One is how they are aligned. So in this case, we want the spatial temporal alignment. So you only want data sets in the case of the, the you know, taxi trips that cover Manhattan, that have the same spatial coverage and those two years, 2010 and 2011. 2011, 2012, right? And you'd also like to specify what is the actual relationship you're looking for. And in this case, what you're looking for is overlap of salient features, these outliers and near outliers. Right. Uh, so, you know, it'd be great to ask this kind of queries, but, uh, you know, what, what is difficult uh, and what are the challenges involved in doing so? So first and foremost, uh, you, if you look at uh, the data sets in NYC open data, uh, they come in many different spatial and temporal resolutions, right? So some have daily resolutions, others monthly, weekly. Some of them have covered the whole of New York City, other than their GPS. And the big question is, um, how do you go about uh, aligning them, right? So how do you actually join these data sets that come in different resolutions, right? Uh, the other problem is that if you're looking, you know, about this correspondence and what is high and what is low actually varies across different data sets, right? So if I want to know what is an outlying rain and an outlying number of trips, uh, what is a high number of rain is, not really comparable to a high number of trips or low, right? Uh, 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 or, or low rain and low number of trips. So the values across different data sets are not really easy to compare, right? And last but not least, you have a, a scalability challenge because, uh, you know, in my open data contains uh, over 2000 data sets. Uh, some of them are very large, you know, they're very tall. They can have like the taxi data has like over a, a bit, five years of taxi data has like about a billion uh, entries, right? And some of them have uh, like the 311 data have, you know, over a hundred different attributes, right? And if you try to look at all combinations of possible relationships, you just have too many things that, and most of them are not going to be uh, uh, meaningful. Right. So to address this problem, we have developed this framework, which we call data polygamy. Uh, and the goal here is to try to discover these spatial temporal relationships and index them uh, in a way that uh, it's uh, fast to um, answer these relate to uh, that enables these relationship queries to be answered e efficiently. Right. Uh, not only that, we'd also like to make sure that uh, we are able to distinguish between relationships that are meaningful or not. Right. Um, so the intuition that we had in terms of um, uh, addressing the problem uh, and um, uh, dealing with some of the challenges that I talked about before was this idea of using a topological representation of the data, right? So this is, was uh, actually Harish, Harish Daraiswamy who was um, uh, a research staff member here at VIDA and he did his PhD in computational topology, right? So it's, a, it's very interesting, you know, when you work in these interdisciplinary groups where the insights come, right? And that turned out to be, you know, uh, uh, an amazing choice because when you use this uh, representation, each attribute in a data set, in a spatial temporal data set, can be represented as a um, uh, time varying scalar function, right? That uh, brings, uh, in, given a point in space and time, it represents some real value, right? And, you know, for example, here, if, if you're looking at taxi data, this could be like at some point space and time, you could look at the number of taxis in that location or the number of pickups and so on, right? And uh, what is uh, nice about this representation is that uh, it, it, you can use it to uniformly represent distinct data sets and distinct attributes within di these different data sets, right? And now they are all in the same format and they, they, they are comparable and 
more easily aligned, right? Uh, and another advantage here is that the topological uh, representation naturally captures um, the atypical behavior that we're interested in, uh, what we call salient feature, right? When you have one of these scalar functions, a salient feature will correspond to a spatial temporal region whose behavior differs from its neighborhood, right? So it's gonna be these peaks and value, valleys, which are the critical points, which correspond to the critical points in the function, right? So that's a, the, the basic idea. I'm gonna, not gonna get into the details, but I'd be happy to talk to folks offline or you can get the details in, in, in our papers here, right? So once you have all your attributes, you know, different data sets represented this way, uh, you can align these um, uh, functions in space and time. And you, once they are aligned, you can look for these relationships. So if you get two attributes, uh, uh, you align them. If you have two peaks that uh, overlap in space and time, you say that you have a positive relationship. And you can think about this as kind of like correlation. This would be uh, equivalent to a, a, a positive correlation. Right? Or if you have the functions aligned and you have a peak corresponding to a valley, that is um, a negative relationship, which again, corresponds to negative correlation, right? Uh, so what we do is that we actually compute this for all the different attributes. Uh, but as I said, once you have, when you have too many attributes, you're gonna have lots of uh, um, um, relationships that are meaningless. So to evaluate relationships uh, and uh, distinguish between what is meaningful or not, we actually developed a restricted Monte Carlo procedure that tests the statistical significance of these relationships, uh, but taking into account both spatial and temporal uh, proximity. And by doing so, we're actually able to uh, prune uh, all the coincidental relationships, right? So we implemented this approach uh, using MapReduce. Uh, again, another advantage of you know, the choices we did, we uh, made with respect to modeling the problem, the, the problem uh, is that you know, all the different steps are embarrassingly parallel. So it's really easy and natural to implement them in MapReduce. Uh, we evaluated the, the approach using uh, a collection of uh, about over 300 data sets, uh, which were the ones that we found that had both spatial and temporal information in, uh, in IC open data. And you know, not surprisingly, the approach scales linearly as we increase the number of nodes, um, uh, you can handle more data. Uh, and we're able to evaluate and derive, you know, uh, relationships uh, very fast, about 10,000 relationships per minute using a node cluster that we had here at Vida, right? Uh, so, so the approach works, it's efficient, but then you may ask, you know, does this actually discover anything that is useful? Um, and uh, we have a number of examples in the paper here, just in the interest of time, I'll show you one example, right? Uh, and also, uh, how data discovery can be useful to answer certain questions. So, um, you know, you all live in New York City, I believe, um, and maybe not, if you moved here before COVID, that, that would be more typical. Um, and, you know, before COVID, when it was raining, it was raining, it's really hard to find a taxi. Um, you're gonna wait a long, long time, you're gonna get soaking wet and taxis are not gonna stop, they're all busy. Right. So why is that the case? Right. So you can translate this question into a relationship query uh, that would ask, you know, find me all the relationships between the taxi data set and a weather data set. And the one of the relationships that uh, the data polygamy framework found is that there is a negative relationship between the number of taxis and average precipitation, which uh, suggests that indeed, when there is rain, there's actually fewer taxis on the streets, right? Uh, and folks in, in uh, you know, transportation and social sciences, they have had this uh, long running hypothesis that um, taxi drivers are target earners. So when it's raining, they get more passengers faster, they reach their target and they go back home. And that's why you end up with fewer taxis on the streets, right? And indeed we actually find a strong positive relationship between um, precipitation and earnings suggesting that this hypothesis is true. Okay. 
Any questions so far? Okay. All right. So, so this uh, you know was useful, but then it, uh, this approach had a um, uh, a limitation. Uh, and one limitation is that we are trying to eliminate all the coincidental relationships, right? But in some cases, um, relationships that are not statistically significant can still be meaningful, right? So if you look at the example for the hurricane, there are only two instances, right? That it's not statistically significant, but we know that the hurricane actually caused the drop in the taxis, right? So, uh, so that is a problem because these are meaningful relationships. So how do we actually identify meaningful relationships even when they're not statistically significant, right? Uh, is, are there different ways of actually determining the significance? And uh, for that, uh, you know, my PhD student, Alini Bessa, came up with this idea of predictable outliers in data trends. And she defined meaningfulness uh, of um, uh, an outlier-based relationship uh, as uh, uh, so, uh, an out, uh, a relationship, uh, an outlier-based relationship is meaningful if it can actually be predicted from values that are non-outliers and that are close to those outliers. So the intuition here is that uh, uh, if you can see it coming, right? If you can actually are able with those values to predict uh, the, the, the trend that leads to that outlier, that relationship is meaningful. So she came up with this uh, you know, new strategy that uses weighted linear regression to detect these data trends and you know, uh, essentially implement this idea of we can see it coming. Uh, and she also looked at another uh, limit, uh, another problem, which was you know, when we did polygamy, we were looking for exact alignment in space and time. And what she realized is that there are a number of events that have lingering effects. So for example, when it snows a lot in the city, uh, it takes a while for the snow to accumulate. So you're only gonna see say a drop in uh, people getting bikes or you know, moving around the city after you know, the snow has accumulated, right? So it takes some time. So she also uh, looked at um, uh, different kinds of alignments uh, that considered outliers that uh, are temporally closed, but not exact, that, that, that do not exact, happen exactly at the same time, right? And uh, she also addressed some, you know, issues with scalability that uh, uh, enables, you know, these outlier based relationships to be um, identified efficiently. Right. So here, the you know, there's an, another variation of a relationship query uh, where uh, the alignment is a, an approximate temporal match, uh, and the relationship that we are looking for is uh, you know corresponding outliers that are predictable. Okay. Okay, so these are kind of like uh, examples of um, relationship queries that you know attempt to say explain data and data features. Right? There's another class of uh, queries that uh, are useful for augmenting data, and you know which in turn can help improve uh, predictive models. Right? And there are different classes of these uh, data set augmentation queries. So uh, the idea here is that your, your, your query again is a data set and you'd like to find data sets that can augment that uh, data set D. And you can be looking for data sets that can be concatenated with your original data set. Say you're doing work and you're using 311 data and you have um, you know, data from 2008 and you'd like you know, to improve your regression model, let's say. So you'd like to find other data sets that look like uh, 311 data, but that covers different years so that you can grow vertically your data set, right? So these are, you know, concatenation or union queries, right? So you can find different, um, you know, versions uh, for different years. Uh, you can also be looking for data sets that can be joined with your uh, original data set. And this is useful when you're creating predictive models to find new features, right? So you start your data set and you'd like to find additional features that may help you know, the, the predictive power of your model, right? Um, so you know, these are very useful, but they're not sufficient. 
Uh, and let me give you an example why. Um, so let's go back to the taxi demand model. And, uh, you know, we start with uh, the, just the taxi data that has, you know, a date, uh, the ID for a location and the number of trips in that location, right? And uh, I can, you know, this, I can do a regression model. This is my, uh, and I want to predict the number of trips in a given location and time. I use a random forest regressor and I get a uh, uh, mean absolute error of 66.67, right? So the question is, you know, can I actually find other data sets that help improve this model? Um, and I can use one of those data augmentation queries, let's say, you know, the join query to find data sets that are joinable with uh, the, you know, taxi data that have information about time and space. And the challenge here is that if I use Octos, our own data set search engine, there are about 855 results, right? So amongst these, which one is actually gonna help me improve my taxi demand model? There are just too many data sets that can be joined with the taxi data, right? So if, you know, if I browse and check a bunch of these snippets, maybe I run into the weather data, I can inspect the variables. They have like uh, temperature, precipitation, and so on. And maybe I select this one. I have to go join that weather data set with my taxi data. I add the new attributes. I train my, uh, retrain my model and I get a big improvement, right? So yes, it's possible to uh, improve the model, but finding what data set uh, is actually gonna be useful amongst those 855 can be very tedious and time consuming, right? So well, the question is, uh, or wouldn't it be much better if I could actually ask this directly through a data discovery query? And this is what we propose with joint correlation queries. And the idea behind these queries is that, you know, again, your query is a data set or a, let's call it a table, TQ. Uh, that has um, a joint column that, that that's what we want to um, align the data sets through and the target column Q and in, in this case when you have predictive models this would be your the, the variable that, that you're trying to predict and what you'd like to do is to find uh, other tables or data sets in, in a collection such that the data set is both joinable with your query data set and it also contains a column that is highly correlated with your uh, prediction variable, right? Is this clear? Okay. So the discovery query that you'd like to ask with, you know, through these joint correlations, going back to the example of the taxi, taxi demand uh, model is, you know, you'd like to find all data sets that join with the taxi data, and that is, uh, that contain um, uh, an attribute that is correlated with the target variable number of trips, right? And, you know, the relationship query here would be, you know, you align through a join, uh, and the relationship is that, you know, the two different data sets have attributes that are correlated. Right. And, you know, this query is as useful not only to identify features, uh, additional features for predictive models, but it can also be useful to find uh, data explanations or causal relationships across different data sets. Right. Uh, but then how do you go about answering these queries? One possible approach is to, uh, you know, like what we did uh, in the example, find joinable tables perform the join and compute the correlation uh, coefficient. The problem here is that joins are a very expensive uh, operation. And when data sets are very large, like the taxi that has 1 billion tuples uh, and do not fit in memory, it's really not practical to actually try and join multiple data sets. Uh, in addition, after you do the join, you still need to compute the correlation across the different uh, attributes. Uh, between the two different attributes. And some of these correlation measures like Spearman can be expensive to compute, right? And then you can say, oh, you could potentially try to pre-compute this and index like what we did uh, you know, uh, with, with polygamy. The problem here is that we want to answer uh, ad hoc queries. So we don't know what the query data set is gonna be beforehand. 
So we cannot pre-compute the relationships. We need to discover the relationships in, in real time. And just to give you an idea in terms of cost, if I'm trying to uh, you know, compute the correlation between taxi and weather, the join alone takes 29 seconds and computing the correlation takes another five seconds, right? So if I have to do that for like a thousand different data sets, it's gonna take a while. You're gonna be sitting in front of your computer for a long time before you, you know the answer, right? Okay, so how, how did we address this problem? So the key idea was, you know, it's not really practical to do this joins and um, compute the correlation in real time. Uh, but there's been a lot of work in terms of summarizing data. So the idea here is, can we come up with a sketch uh, of the data set uh, that is a, you know, a, a smaller version of the data set, a, rep a smaller representative version of the uh, data sets, um, and then compute the correlation using these sketches. So the idea here would be like reducing the input size uh, at the cost of deriving uh, approximate results, right? But then the difficulty here comes, you know, how do you actually do the sampling uh, to create these uh, sketches, right? Uh, and the difficulty comes from the fact that uh, we really want to compute the correlation. Uh, if you have two different data sets, uh, TX and TY, right? You'd like to estimate the correlation between X and Y on the join table, right? But all that you have, are the base tables that are, you know, disparate and not really aligned, right? Um, so you could say, okay, so let's take a random sample of just the values. The problem here is that we don't know which values are included in, in the join, right? So if I, you know, select everything, I, I, may, I may not get a good representation of what is gonna be in the join table. Right, uh, and you know, in order to generate the sample again, you need to have the values aligned using the join key. Right, uh, you could also think, okay, I can just sample the rows randomly, and it doesn't work either because I, I may not select rows that would actually be present in the join. Right, so if you join over these independent samples, you can end up with bad join probabilities that do not really reflect the distribution of the join table. Right. So what we did is that we extended this idea of K and B sketches uh, for joint correlation. Uh, sorry, this thing is jumping by itself. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so we extended this idea of K and B sketch. And you know, the, the idea is uh, simple. We can use hashing functions that will create a data sketch for each table in your collection. Right, so you have a table uh, and you create a sketch LKX that has key K and the attribute that, that you're uh, summarizing as X, right? And you represent that by the hash values of the key associated with the value of the attribute, right? Uh, and in KMV, what you do is you select, uh, you create a sketch that contains the n minimal values of these uh, hash function. And what we showed um, in, in our paper is that by doing this, we are able to recover a uniform random sample of the join table by joining the sketches. And once you have that, you can actually apply any correlation estimator over the sketch join. So here's you know, how, how it, it would work. I have uh, you know, my, my, my tables, I generate the sketches of the table. And because these sketches are small, I can in real time perform the join and compute an estimate for the correlation, right? So with this, uh, we are able to build an index of these sketches for the tables that are in the uh, collection uh, so that when a new you know, query comes in, we can actually very fast and efficiently find the tables that are joined and correlated, right? Uh, and we can do that, you know, uh, at interactive response times and without having to compute full joins or uh, correlation over the full um, um, columns in the table, right? Uh, and this is uh, something that we described in a paper that we had last year at Sigma. And this year, 
we uh, actually, uh, Aesio Santos, uh, also a PhD student of mine, came up with this idea of a new hashing scheme that makes these queries even faster, right? So you can see the details here, or, or me or Aesio would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, any questions so far about the queries? I'm almost done. I'm just gonna, you know, very fast go over um, some other challenges in data set search. Any questions? Yeah, thank you so much. I yeah, like, I just wanted to remind everyone that I want to remind you we are um, getting close to. We have about 15 minutes left before 1 p.m. So I wanted to make. Usually I should have said this in the beginning, but usually we just yeah. try and have the last 15 minutes for Q and A. Mm -hmm. So okay. maybe um, if we can try and wrap up in the next few minutes, and then we that way people yes. have plenty of yeah. time to ask questions. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Sounds good. All right. So so I talked about you know some of these data discovery queries. Uh, but data set search is a, a bigger problem and there are additional challenges in terms of uh, enabling people to um, you know, search for data sets. Um, so the first one is that um, you know, I, I gave you examples of uh, vertical repositories and Google data set search, but it's often the case that when you have a specific problem, uh, it's hard to collect all the data sets that are relevant for that particular problem. Say, for example, folks at uh, CASP uh, that are looking for data about noise, right? That's the Sounds of New York Sonic project. Uh, there are data about noise in many different websites, many different repositories. How do you go about collecting all of those? Uh, and you know, the traditional answer is that people can build web crawlers that go and try to find these data sets. And again, this is a place where traditional uh, web search techniques cannot be directly applied. Because if you look at the web crawler, what it does is that recursively crawls through links. It finds a page, gets all the links, follow all those links, find other pages and does that recursively. The problem when you're searching for data sets is that uh, data sets don't link to other data sets. Actually repositories don't link to other repositories. So you cannot really do this recursive crawling, right? So how Xiang uh, Zhang uh, was my PhD student, he actually came up with a new focus crawling strategy uh, that uses search and traditional search engines, and instead of crawling, it actually keeps jumping over different websites to find these relevant data sets. Okay. Uh, so another challenge uh, that I alluded to in the beginning of the talk is that you know if you just do textual search over metadata, it's it's insufficient to uh, you know pose these more, uh, I'd say, expressive queries, right? So instead of relying on metadata provided by publishers, uh, it's important to actually look at the contents of the data uh, and create summaries of that that can support these more expressive queries, right? Um, and the third problem, uh, you know, that is a uh, research problem that is uh, very interesting and challenging is, you know, how do you actually, can that is that we need to rethink a search interface uh, and design interaction uh, and visual interactions and visual representations that are actually suitable and help with data set discovery. Right, and that we've been trying to address this uh, these questions in the context of uh, you know this Octus data set search engine. As I said, we're trying to implement a number of these ideas uh, in the system. Uh, it um, uh, it, Octus goes, you know, uses uh, Haoxiang's crawler to discover uh, data across different repositories and it indexes this data and it provides a searchable interface. Uh, but it also allows users to bring their own data and upload into the, um, the system. Uh, it uh, performs automatic profiling that uh, will create these uh, summaries of the contents of the data uh, so that uh, you can support the expressive queries. Um, uh, we have started to um, design this new query interface. And uh, we're right now at the point where we're doing a user study to look at and, um, uh, and evaluate our design decisions, right? So what I'll close with is a brief uh, video of uh, how Octus work. And that that's much easier than, you know, trying to describe um, using words. So let me know if you don't hear the sound. Octus is a search engine, like Google, but for datasets. Similar to Google, you can pose keyword-based search queries. For example, you can search for datasets on cyclist behavior by typing in the search box. 
Optus then retrieves and ranks the most relevant datasets from its index. For this particular example, Octus fetched over 30 results. We can quickly inspect them. Let's explore the highest ranked result, cyclist crashes in Australia. Its snippet on the left shows key features including its description, the names of its columns, and their data types. Before adding a dataset to its index, Octus profiles its contents to derive metadata. Here, you can see that the profiler detected both temporal and spatial attributes. When you click on a result snippet, you can see a summary of its contents. For example, the user can inspect the spatial coverage of the dataset on a map. Users can also inspect a sample of the dataset contents, the columns with the inferred data types, and by selecting column view, they can see statistics for the columns. The goal is to provide enough details about each dataset so that the user can more quickly ascertain its relevance. If the user finds the dataset relevant, she can then download it. A novel aspect of Octus is that it supports a rich set of data discovery queries. Besides keywords, users can also explore dataset collections based on space, time, and data relationships. For example, if the user is interested in datasets about bicycle usage, but only in the United States, she can type cyclist in the search box and additionally click on any location to specify a spatial constraint. Here, she can create a polygon around the US. Note that the results now only show datasets from the United States. We can also specify a time period of interest to find datasets that are more aligned with our information needs. If we want the most recent data, we can search for data sets from 2019 to 2021, and we can also specify the desired temporal resolution, for example, with timestamps on a daily basis. Octus allows data augmentation queries. Let's suppose that an expert in the New York City Department of Transportation is trying to understand bike usage in New York City. She searches for relevant data sets by typing a simple query in the search box, and after some inspection, she decides to use a dataset on bicycle trip counts on the East River bridges. She wants to use it to create a model to see if daily temperatures, represented by attribute high temp, help predict the number of bikes crossing the bridges, represented as total. Unfortunately, this dataset only covers the month of April 2020, which is not enough to understand how bicycle usage varies throughout the seasons. She then goes back to the snippet of the dataset and presses button search related to see if she can find more compatible data records to build a model. She sets the option augmentation type as union and then re-executes the search. By inspecting the resulting dataset, she sees that it contains the same kind of data, but stemming from May to October 2020. The augment options tab informs her that a union can be performed between her input dataset and this new dataset, listing the matched attributes. By pressing the Merge, Union, and Download button, Octus automatically performs the union and downloads the augmented dataset to her machine. She then creates a simple regression model to see if daily temperatures are good enough to predict the number of bicycles crossing the bridges. As we can see, she obtains an R-squared score that is close to 0 0.25. This model is probably underfitting the data for like so I, I could stop here. I have a link to the YouTube in the slides. And uh, so the, uh, she's just going to go on and show how you can actually find joinable data sets and how that can improve. But I can stop here and uh, you know you can open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Furry. That was so such a brilliant talk. I feel like that was just so clear. And it's so brilliant what you're doing with data queries. So I'm going to have very questions. kind of you. <laughs> OK. I have many questions myself, but let me open it up to the audience. Um, does anybody, if anybody has a question, they can either raise their hand or they can just speak up and start talking, or they can write something in the chat if they don't feel comfortable talking. Yeah. Unaccustomed as I am to asking questions, it's Yuri mm -hmm. Parashek again, Botaji. Uh, so one of the things I've been having a, a trouble with is looking at uh, maps, satellite, um, maps. Uh, obviously, this is a whole different space. Uh, you know, looking at the destruction in Mariupol and places like this. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest um, providing um, 
search capabilities for something of that order. Oh, so if you have, so, so if you're looking at specific satellite data. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of this data comes in and it's very generic mm -hmm. originally. And being able to determine whether the data is even there sometime. Uh, of late, the satellite uh, maps are not available on some systems because of the war. But irrespective of that, um, in trying to understand what is available in satellite maps, uh, in satellite images, sorry, remote images for GIS purposes. Is, uh -huh. You have to just struggle around to find out what really works. Right, so, so, but, but you're, so, so I'm just trying to figure out, so you have the satellite images or you want to find the satellite images? So there are satellite images, generically mm -hmm. say this satellite image is from this period of time. I see. But, trying to determine what is available within that image um, is, is, you know, you have to do a lot of this manually, just looking at things. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so there's, a, there's some work uh, that is trying to use machine learning to identify these features, right? Uh, uh, you know, essentially learning to identify particular yeah. patterns. Yeah. Uh, so I've seen work that, uh, you know, they use satellite, okay, where there's green, where there's a constructed, mm -hmm. um, a city and so on. Is that what you're looking for? It is. Um, I see. And also, yeah. a lot of this stuff is used for agricultural purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, right. identifying the, the grain and the state of it and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So, the, the, the challenge with all these uh, techniques that require machine learning is that you have to train, right? And, uh, you know, if you have new things that haven't been done before, then you have to build training data and that's not ideal. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, anything that is like a, like a All right. I, Thanks. Uh, off the shelf solution yeah, yeah. to this problem. No. Sorry. Thanks again for your talk. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Well, I have a question. If mm -hmm. um, one, one, I was curious about the um, the pods. Uh, algorithm, I get predictable outliers and data trends. Um, and the idea of um, sometimes an outlier relationship is very important, but it won't be statistically significant. And then I, I don't know, I, I think you described it, but I, I missed the explanation. So what the first way of dealing with this was to see if something can be predicted by seeing when it's coming. But it right. seems that with like the example of the hurricane, you would would you have that, would you be able to predict it from the previous data or is that a situation where you would not be able to predict it and then you would need to use a different method? Right. So, so, so I, I should have had the, so I think it's easy and, and, and I, I didn't want to get into details, but maybe I, I, I hid too many details. So the intuition here is that if you, if you have your two attributes, right, and you do a scatter plot, Right, so the example that I had on the slide was actually 311 calls and um, uh, 311 calls, uh, heating complaints and temperature. So that, that's the, the plot that I had there, right? So if you do a scatter plot of heating complaints and um, uh, temperature, you're going to see that there is, you know, if you look at the, the points, you can see that there is a trend that uh, lower the temperature the, at, after a certain point, when the temperature gets low, you, you get more heating complaints, right? So that's the, the kind of like the intuition behind that, right? And, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like and within when, a very local time window, you can make these predictions kind of. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So actually, so we look for the trends. So we throw, to look for the trends, we throw away the time, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, so okay. we just look at the, how the values are related. So forget about, so the, the, the data, you know, we know that they're aligned. We throw away the time and we just look at the scatter plot of the, of the values and see if there is a trend, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Is that clear now? Yeah, I think yeah, it is. So yeah. Next time Thank I'm gonna you. have the plot, yeah, sorry. Thank you so much. And I mean, I guess, but that, 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 I guess just to follow up on that, that, so the, when you're throwing away the time, but the but the the correlation between the two attributes is going to be 
building up within like kind of a local time window of like right before the event is going to happen actually like peaks so you see like if we were to look at it, it would be that data that would be correlated maybe i'm not understanding correctly right so uh I, I can i can try to pull up the plot right so we have the two data sets that we know cover that time period right mm -hmm. but now we throw away the time and we just mm -hmm. look at the values and we try to see a trend in the values you know it's like low temperature higher number of complaints, or maybe very high temperatures, high number of complaints, right? So that, that's essentially, it's like a, if the values, if there is a trend in the values, not the time, right? Uh, we can see the time if, you know, in the plot that I had in, 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 in the slide, right? That, that they coincide, but what we're interested in is not just where they coincide, because we know that they coincide, is whether, you know, the, an increase in one leads to that, big increase or that outlier so interesting thank you so much so i guess we have a, a question in the chat um by ricardo barros lauren lorenco a very interesting presentation it seems that these explainability applications are quite well developed for social sciences applications do you think that this is also feasible for environmental sciences with usage of sensor data such as satellites and drones, for example. Obrigado. Like, is that <laughs> Brazilian? Is yeah, that so that's, uh, that's Portuguese. Yeah. yeah. No, so I think that, the, you know, potentially, yes, right? So uh, the, 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 the both data polygamy and uh, pods, they consider, you know, polygamy considers space and time, pods consider time, right? So uh, it should be, you know, it, it depends on the quantities that you're looking at, right, and then what kinds of questions that uh, you, you're asking, but you know, it, it should be possible, uh, provided that you model your data in a way that, that it's amenable to the questions that you have in mind. So the techniques are not specifically designed for, you know, social science data, right? So polygamy is spatial, temporal, and uh, numerical data. It's a numerical value. Pods is temporal data with uh, numerical values. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we'll stop it there as we're five minutes over. I want to respect everyone's time. Uh, hello. Oh, you have a question. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Freddy. Actually, I'm from India and I'm Very also nice a prospective you. student to NYU Tandon for fall 22. Uh, so my question was that uh, I was actually trying to connect two of the concepts uh, here. Uh, first, you talked about the uh, you know correlations between the uh, between two uh, between the features of the two data sets. There can be negative or positive correlation, okay. uh, as you explained earlier, between taxi and the uh, the number of taxis that are uh, present on the road and uh, the weather of the NYC. Can we connect such kind of concepts to explainability or interpretability of a model? For example, we use uh, the concept of interpretability or we use line uh, tools like line to explain the predictions of a model. You think that mm -hmm. these uh, concepts can actually help uh, boost uh, the explainability or uh, explanations for the prediction of a model? Right, so 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 here it, it's it's a different levels of granularity, right? Because Lyme, it's local explanation. You have a prediction that is trying to explain that particular prediction, right? So here we're looking at a coarser grain, which is you know what data sets might improve the overall prediction accuracy of that particular model. So it's more global, right? Uh, and it's also best effort. We, we don't know beforehand. We, you know, it's just that there are like 800 data sets and I'd like to find you know, maybe 10 or five that I could actually train and test and figure out whether they improve or not, right? So I think that it's, 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 it is at a different level in terms of explainability. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, do we have any last questions before we... Adjourn. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ferry. Again, that was such, so a br such a brilliant talk. I really, really enjoyed it. 
Thanks, so. Jackie and Shara Lampos. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we could just give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you. A virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Thank you. All right. Enjoy the weekend. Okay. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.